Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Spencerville Seventh-day Adventist Church, our special afternoon program on the upcoming Supreme Court case. Uh, my name is Nicholas Miller. I'm a relatively new member here at Spencerville. My wife and I, Leanne, joined uh, last summer. Um, I transferred from Andrews University uh, in Berrien Springs, Michigan, where I was and, and still am actually a professor of church history. Um, but I'm also an attorney, a lawyer, and so Andrews said that I could be of just uh, as much use here in the Washington, D.C. area to help run their Center uh, for, um, for L Religious Liberty. And also in the last few months, I've connected with Washington Adventist University and uh, helping lead their Center for Law and Public Policy. And in that role, I helped uh, worked with our uh, pastor here, Crystal Ward, to put together this special program uh, regarding a Supreme Court case that is being argued this coming Tuesday, Groth versus DeJoy. And we have some special guests, some speakers, including lawyers and religious liberty leaders, both from our church as well as from at least one other church, the Baptist Joint Committee. And they're going to go through a series of short presentations about this case and its significance. Uh, to us as, as Adventists, as Christians, uh, people of any faith, actually. And uh, just to give you a sense of why we're talking about this case, I would put it to you, this is the most important church-state case for our church in probably the last 50 years. Um, I was speaking with my uh, friend Todd McFarland, and our assessment, he works at the General Conference as a lawyer, is there are about a thousand Adventist members every year who have problems with Sabbath keeping in relation to their work and their employment, right? As Adventists, we're constantly thinking to the future of, of Sunday laws and the government requiring some sort of Sunday worship, but that hasn't happened yet. But what people do lose or have trouble with is their employment and their Sabbath convictions. And a thousand members every year, not all of those lose their jobs, primarily or in good part because of our public affairs and religious liberty leaders who are able to step in and write a letter and, and point out their rights under the law. But as will be explained, those rights are not as strong as they could or as they should be. And now there's a test case come out of the Pacific Union uh, brought by one of our attorneys here that is going to ask the Supreme Court to heighten that standard, to provide greater protection for Adventists and all Christians and all people of faith so they don't have to choose between their livelihood and serving God. And that's why we're here today, uh, to learn how we can better understand our rights under the law as they are and as they might be, and that we can be a resource to our family, to our friends, to our co-workers, in when they might need help in standing for their own conscience and their own religious beliefs. So welcome to our program. I'm glad that you're here. Looking forward to the engagement of these, uh, these individuals who will shortly be uh, introduced to you. But let's begin with a word of prayer. Bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your watch care over us, for bringing us together to discuss this important topic of not only Sabbath convictions, but religious convictions generally. Um, living in a society that prioritizes commerce and business, that often these convictions are um, pressured to give way uh, before uh, work and before uh, our jobs. And may the time we spend here together give us a perspective on how we can best stand up for both our consciences and those of others. Uh, in our workplaces, and I pray for the presence of your spirit among us today, for we pray these things in your name. Amen. Now I'm going to turn the time over and the mic to uh, Pastor Crystal Ward. She's a pastor here at the Spencerville Church. She's highly qualified for uh, helping lead this panel because she was one of my star students last year in my class on the pastor and the law and religious liberty. Uh, she is not just a student, uh, however, finishing her MDiv fairly soon, but she comes from a professional background in banking and high finance in New York uh, until the Lord called her into the pastoral ministry. But she has a sense of public affairs in the church 
And uh, I'm happy to have her come and introduce and then uh, moderate the panel. Pastor Crystal? Yes. Thank you, Professor Nick. And it's such a blessing to be here and to be able to moderate this, this panel. And I will say, um, I actually did get an A in Professor Nick's class. So just in case you were wondering. <laughs> So as he mentioned, we are here to talk about a very important topic, and I have this excellent opportunity to introduce you to the panel. So the first person we'll have on is no stranger to us, Bill Knott, who is the Associate Director of Public Affairs and Religious Liberty for the General Conference. We also have Jennifer Hawks, She's an Associate Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty. She's also an ordained minister and an attorney as well. We have Alan Reynak, who's Director of Public Affairs and Religious Liberty for the Pacific Union Conference, and he's an attorney as well. You can clap. Some people want to clap, so that's fine. <laughs> We have Todd McFarlane, who's no stranger to our church. He's Deputy General Counsel for the General Conference and an attorney as well. And last but not least, we have Melissa Reed, who's the Associate Director of Public Affairs and Religious Liberty for the North American Division. So we can give a round of applause to our esteemed panel. So as we think about this case, I mean, something that I thought was really important as you hear from our panel, who are very esteemed and knowledgeable in what they do, but we wanna make sure that the questions that you have, the way it's addressed, that you actually understand the importance of religious liberty and why this is beneficial for you to even be a part of this program. So a question I have for you, Todd. You know, as we talk about religious liberties, often there's this term thrown around, Title VII. Like, what exactly is Title VII? How does that relate to the First Amendment, and, and what does that pertain to religious liberty in the workplace? Sure. Title VII, I think, is a law that everyone is familiar with, even if they don't know it by that name, right? That was the major Civil Rights Act back in 1964, came out of the Civil Rights Movement, and that was the law that made it, amongst other things, illegal on a federal level, discriminate on the basis of race, color, national origin, sex, and then importantly, what we're talking about today is religion. And that law... Um, as it was originally written in 1964, just simply said you couldn't discriminate on the basis of religion. And so the question then came up, well, what does that mean? So obviously you can't put a sign in the door that says, you know, no Catholics need apply or no Seventh-day Adventists need apply. But what is the requirement to make an accommodation or make an exception? In other words, you can put on there, you know, Saturday work absolutely required and that will have the same equivalent as saying no practicing Seventh-day Adventist needs need to apply. And so what does that law do with that? And so what happened is there were some cases and the Congress clarified it in 1972. And then the reason that we're here today was because in 1977, there was a case of a church of a guy named Hardison um, who worked for Transworld Airlines. Remember that? Anyone ever fly on TWA back in the day? Um, and he was Worldwide Church of God, um, and he wouldn't work on Saturdays. At that time, the Worldwide Church of God didn't lift the Sabbath observance. And so the case went all the way to the Supreme Court and said, well, what obligations do the Worldwide Church of or does TWA have to make to accommodate Mr. Hardison and his, his religious beliefs? And uh, they were primarily, quite frankly, looking at one particular issue, and that dealt with the labor unions. So uh, TWA was a unionized environment, and uh, scheduling and time off and when you worked was all governed by seniority. And so at the time, the argument was, well, listen, the union has to make a change to their seniority system that the civil rights law trumped the seniority system of the union. And that was the issue that was litigated. And that's what the briefs were all about. That's what they talked about at oral argument. That was the primary focus of that case. However, in there, they made almost in passing a comment that says, well, anything more than, and I promise I'll use my one Latin phrase or, uh, for the day, <laughs> anything more than de minimis, right, or more than minimal, that would create an undue hardship. And that was the issue 
that ended up really being the holding in that case, or maybe the holding in that case, but that the Court of Appeals since 1977 have really made it almost impossible in a lot of circumstances for Adventists and others to get Sabbath off because all an employer has to show is more than a minimal hardship or cost. And so it's that case from 1977, you know, 26 years later, that we are looking at should that language of the, yeah, for, sorry, 46, um, yeah, sorry, uh, 46 years, should that language still apply today? And so we're going to talk today about the pluses and minuses of that and kind of how we got here. But that is sort of the background, right, is what is an employer required to do? How, how much out of their way do they have to go to try to accommodate a church member or anyone really when it comes to their religious belief? So in essence, Todd, like this concept of undue hardship, that's us right. trying to assess, well, what does that even really mean? How is that defined? Exactly. And that phrase, you know, undue hardship, and, you know, we've, I've spent more of my life thinking about that phrase than, than I ever thought I would is really what's at the core of what the Supreme Court is going to be uh, hearing this coming Tuesday, and then we'll be, um, we'll be deciding by the end of June. So just that may come up later, but the case that we're having here, will be, we'll get a decision by the end of June. So following up with that, Alan, as we're talking about this Groff case, like what exactly is the Supreme Court going to be deciding, and why is this even important and re relevant to us as we talk about religious liberties? Well, I, th I thought you wanted me to at least give a little bit of the story of, of Gerald's case. So let me, let me start there. Um, <clears throat> and, and since you introduced me from the Pacific Union, I have to tell you that Mr. Groff lives and works in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. And the way that we got the case all the way out west is that we've developed <clears throat> a, a legal services ministry over the years and networked very... Um, thoroughly within both the faith and secular legal communities. So we're representing people of many different faiths. And I got a call and, and a request to represent, uh, to assist a postal worker in Pennsylvania. And I've never not had a post office case in my office for many, many years. Because a post office is horrible when it comes to accommodation. Uh, so, you know, knowing something about how the system works and, and the federal administrative process is, is very different. I agreed and <clears throat> we had a wonderful Christian attorney in Pennsylvania uh, working with us and helping Mr. Groff for almost two years before he finally quit his job. And he had been a returning missionary, very devout, single uh, individual. Uh, and, and thought, you know, the post office would be a, a good job for him to make a career out of. And he started out as a rural route carrier. So in that capacity, he's basically filling in for other carriers who are full-time carriers. And uh, there's no guarantee of any particular shifts or hours, but of course, this was before the Amazon contract. And for many years, the post office doesn't deliver on Sundays, uh, except in a handful of primarily Adventist communities where they don't deliver on Saturday. Uh, although even in Loma Linda, they, they put a stop to that. So I don't know what they're doing in, in some of the other communities, but uh, they're now delivering on Saturdays in Loma Linda. Um, I had a case against the Loma Linda Post Office a few years ago. Uh, Bill, Bill is smiling here. So, <clears throat> you know... What we found as we got into this is as long, as, well, so the first post office he's at, when the Amazon contract comes in, uh, they accommodate him through the first holiday season, but uh, as it gets into spring, the postmaster says, we're not going to do this again. You're going to have to deliver, you're going to have to be part of the rotation this coming winter. And so he finds a smaller post office that's not part of the Amazon contract, and he gives up his seniority and future full-time career, you know, which takes time to, to work into uh, by transferring to the Holtwood Post Office. And <clears throat> while he was there, as long as the postmaster was able to work the schedule, you know, when he normally did, I think at the beginning of the week, he didn't have a problem finding coverage for Sundays. But 
higher ups put a stop to that and said, no, uh, the contract doesn't allow that. You have to keep him on the schedule and only fill it in when he calls off. Well, he wasn't obligated to call off until Saturday. So he calls in Saturday morning, inevitably, and then they have to scramble and cover. And on a couple of occasions, the postmaster himself had to cover uh, the delivery. But, but that's not unusual. In the post office, postmasters have to do something called crossing crafts and do some clerk work or some delivery work from time to time. And, it, and it's expected. In fact, they have rules about you can't do it too much because it's expected that they will do it some. <clears throat> Well, he gets written up progressive discipline. He gets hauled in for counseling's time and time and time again. And meanwhile, we're representing him. And eventually, he decides that he, it's, it's not advantageous to have a termination of federal employment on your record if you ever want to do that again. And so he submits his resignation in anticipation of being fired. Uh, case goes first to the district court. Both sides asked the district court to rule in their favor. We asked for what's called summary judgment. Court rules in favor of the post office on very slim facts and says, well, um, they did accommodate him. And uh, besides, it would have been an undue hardship to do anything further. Goes up to the Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit in, Pencil in, in Philadelphia. And the Third Circuit says, well, no, they didn't accommodate him because they still required him to work Sundays. They didn't eliminate the conflict between his faith and, uh, and his job. Uh, and that was an important win right there, getting them to, to establish that the duty is actually to eliminate the conflict, which kind of makes sense. It's not an accommodation if you still have to violate your faith, right? Mm. Uh, but then they said, yeah, there's, you know, under this de minimis hardship standard, post office has enough evidence of, of hardship. And so they ruled for the post office. But it set up the case very cleanly for the Supreme Court to decide, well, what actually should the standard of hardship be? be, because that's really the issue in the case. And, <clears throat> you know, thanks to the work of others, including my neighbor here, Todd McFarland, this was not the first time the court had an opportunity to consider this issue. So th I think about three years earlier in an Adventist case called Patterson against Walgreens, was it, um, that, that Todd was shepherding, three justices said, yeah, you know, we need to take a look at this issue. They, didn't, they decided that Patterson was not the right case to do it. And at the time, I think they had four or five uh, other religious freedom cases on the docket. So here, we get up with our petition. There's no other religious freedom cases on the docket. We've got the issue squarely presented. And we're like, now's our time. You know, now it's not a Sabbatarian case as far as an Adventist, as Saturday Sabbath. It's a, a Sunday Sabbatarian case with probably the least, um, uh, how, how do we describe the post office? Not exactly um, a popular, uh, <laughs> you know, employer. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's not like, <clears throat> anyway. Uh, so for better or worse, uh, it's uh, a David against Goliath here. And, uh, you know, the federal government itself is the defendant and the Solicitor General's office, uh, which is part of the Justice Department, is representing uh, Louis DeJoy, the most popular postmaster in U.S. history, right? <laughs> so there you go. And I, hopefully I answered your question, but uh, th th that's what we're looking forward to. We've got very seasoned uh, very competent appellate counsel. I am it's my client, but I'm not arguing the case. Uh, we've got very, very good appellate counsel. They're very well prepared, and we're looking, we're hoping and praying for the best. I mean, you touched on some of this a little bit already, but just so that our congregation can fully understand. Like, so what do you see as some of the most challenging aspects of this case? that will be discussed? Well, look, there's two issues. The first issue is what about the Hardison test? Uh, you know, the Hardison test really was based on a completely different uh, concept of neutrality that anything more than being neutral to religion uh, raises concerns under the First Amendment's Establishment Clause. Well, the court um, reversed that concept in a case involving 
the wearing of a, 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 a young uh, Muslim woman who interviewed for a job at Abercrombie and Fitch back, and the case went up in 2015, and the court said, no, this is not about neutrality. It's about, you know, accommodation requires employers to give favored treatment to those who need special accommodations, who need religious accommodations. So the first question is, okay, if this sort of neutrality principle and de minimis hardship is really not consistent with congressional intent and the plain language of undue hardship, then what standard do we use to replace it? And the government sort of concedes that, at least as it's been interpreted, uh, the, the de minimis standard really is not adequate. Um, they kind of propose something keeping the de minimis language, but some sort of clarification. And we're saying, well, you know, Congress has repeatedly used the same language of, of reasonable accommodation short of undue hardship in other statutes, like the Americans with Disabilities Act and, and, and others, and, and they define it as a significant difficulty or expense. And a number of states have done that as well, like New York and, and California. And, and so we think that that's a tried and true standard that would give people of faith the same sort of protection and dignity that other groups of people um, give. The second question is also important because a lot of courts have said, <clears throat> well, you know, if we accommodate this individual, then that's going to put a burden on coworkers and, and that's an undue hardship on the business. Well, <clears throat> The statute requires the employer to show an undue hardship on the conduct of the business. And so the question becomes how much of a burden to be absorbed by coworkers then becomes uh, an actual burden on the business itself. And that's going to be very, I, I think there's a lot of play even more so in the second issue than in the first issue. All right, thanks for that. And we'll have a chance for everyone in the audience to ask questions. So think about your questions as you're listening to the discussions on this panel. So I have a question for you, Jennifer. As we think about this case, um, beyond if, if the Supreme Court were to rule in Groff's favor, who else stands to benefit in terms of the outcome of this case? Like, what are your thoughts on that? Well, at the end of the day, all employees who observe religious practices stand to benefit um, because it, it would raise the standard and require employers to work more with their employees on how can we accommodate the, these religious practices. Not every religious practice is going to be able to be accommodated at the end of the day, um, but it, it would certainly incentivize the employer to come to the table and, and have a conversation about what is, what is really needed and what is really helpful. Um, and so... Um, Getting off for Sabbath observance or holy days is is, is one of the bulk uh, part of the cases. Whether it, whether you're a Muslim and it's a Friday observance, Seventh Day Adventist, Seventh Day Baptist, uh, Jewish, and it's a Saturday observance, or um, or another form of, of more mainstream Christianity, which uh, which would be a, a Sunday observance. Um, uh, but you can also imagine, you know, there's religious dress requirements for many r religious traditions, and so those may conflict. Um, you know, if you wear, have to wear a hijab and you have to have a hard hat for your job as well, like how can we combine those two? The standard is so low right now, employers can basically just say, uh, it, the five minutes it'll take me to come up with the solution is more than a de minimis burden, and so I don't actually have to have this conversation. Um, and and so, so it's important that we bring employers to the table and incentivize them to have those conversations. Um, and so it, it's, it's holy days, um, uh, dress, and then uh, gr grooming standards, so beards, l long hair, you know, for our uh, our indigenous neighbors um, and, and for many other religious groups that they may have grooming requirements that, that, that are outside of, 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 a, of a, a company's um, um, grooming standards. Um, and so, so, so all of us st stand to benefit ultimately um, because religious freedom in the U.S. is protected to the individual. And, and so as many individuals as we have is the, is the, the number of people who, who potentially can benefit from it. So any thoughts on, like, what about an individual who's not really religious? I mean, everything that we spoke about so far is protecting someone who has religious practices. But for the person who's not religious, could they feel discriminated against because everything is now geared towards those who are practicing religion? Like, what are your thoughts about that? 
Um, it's a question we, we hear a lot, um, but it's also a false, di false dichotomy. Employers have to accommodate a lot of things in the workplace. You know, if someone calls in sick at 8 a.m. Tuesday morning um, and they're not showing up that day, the employer has to figure out how to scramble. Does someone else n n need to step in and take over these duties? Um, can this just wait till the next day when the employee returns from sick leave? If someone has to leave early, if a parent has to leave early to pick up a child, if you have someone who is differently abled and we need to have a ramp or we need to have um, you know, text to speech on, on the computer. Like there's all kinds of accommodations employers make. And so setting it up as religion is somehow the only type of um, activity or, 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 or practice that, that, that gets accommodated and, and nothing else gets accommodated um, starts the conversation with religion in, you know, kind of a down position. Um, so, but if we think of religion as one of the many types of things that, 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 that are accommodated, um, that, then that is um, a, a more helpful framing. And then also the courts have been pretty expansive as what religion means when it comes to religious belief and religious practice. And so, um, you know, the, the, there, are, there are humanists and agnostics and, and atheists who have been accommodated as a religious accommodation in other types of cases. Um, and, you know, so that's not beyond the realm of possibility that that could come in in, in a future case as well. Thanks for that. Um, Melissa, a question for you. Um, especially in your role as Associate Director of Religious Liberty at the NAD. So I think even to explain to everyone, what does that even mean? But in thinking about this case in particular, like if this Title VII issue is not fixed or addressed, then from a legislative standpoint, like what types of advocacy work are, are you doing to help in terms of resolving that? Sure. So, um, yeah, so I'm the associate, or one of the associate directors of public affairs and religious liberty for the North American Division. My primary uh, responsibility in that role is to advocate for the religious liberty interest of both the Seventh day Adventist Church as an organization and its members in North America. So, um, that's why I'm, I'm speaking to the legislative experience and I'm standing on some very broad uh, distinguished shoulders in doing that type of work. And um, so you ask about the types of, um, of re uh, resources or recourses that we have looked at legislatively. The Seventh-day Adventist Church was involved in the early 2000s in drafting a piece of legislation called the Workplace Religious Freedom Act. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that piece of legislation. Um, again, it was dealing with not, you know, WERFA as it was called, which is hard to say, so um, particularly, anyway, um, which is hard to say, but, um, but an important piece of potential legislation. And basically that piece of legislation would have been looking to restore the standard that was originally set by the Civil Rights Act, right? It wasn't asking for a blank check for religious accommodation, as Jennifer mentioned. There are some things that just, it cannot be, you know, they cannot be accommodated. As a Seventh-day Adventist who doesn't feel comfortable um, in a, an environment with alcohol, I can't expect to be accommodated if I go apply at a bar, right? I mean, that just doesn't make sense. And so um, what WERFA looked at was um, saying, we just want to restore that standard and basically, you know, that reasonable accommodation standard that we're seeing in other uh, protected areas of employment. And, um, but at the same time is um, not, char not um, char <coughs> causing an undue hardship on the employer as well. So just that balancing act. And so um, it's pretty incredible when we look at it through the lens of 2023, but there was real um, bipartisan support for this legislation. Um, for example, the lead sponsors were John Kerry and, and, San, and Senator Santorum, you know, very <coughs> different politically, but came together on this piece of legislation. And co-sponsors included John Cornyn from Texas, Hillary Clinton, you may have heard of her, um, uh, Chuck Schumer, uh, still going, but has a different opinion about workplace accommodation now. Um, but, and, uh, and uh, oh, um, Brownback, um, who then went on to be the International Religious Freedom uh, Ambassador for the, for the State Department. And so that was actually, we felt, you know, w a proud moment to see these group. you know, there wasn't, the there wasn't the bipartisan angst that there is today in the early 2000s, but there certainly was you know, uh, challenges there. And so to see those group of individuals and then a real diversity 
of religious, um, both denominations and religious freedom organizations. There were Christians, Muslims, Jews, Sikhs, just um, a real diversity, again, hitting us or, or it's their members um, in, in different ways, right? We were looking for different types, as, as Jennifer was talking about. There are all different areas of accommodation required. And then there were lots of, there were uh, many organizations that were saying, you know, actually this isn't a real big deal to us in our membership, but it matters to you and you matter to us. And so they came on as advocacy partners as well. And so that was really neat. Um, big credit, to, uh, so, so that coalition of groups, so the, the, um, in 2003, the Workplace uh, Religious Freedom Act got uh, a hearing um, in, in the Senate, and um, James Standish, who used to uh, serve as the Government Affairs Director for the General Conference, actually testified at that hearing. Uh, I think some of you were even there. Um, and uh, then it didn't go anywhere beyond, it didn't, it didn't leave the, the hearing, the, the subcommittee, um, and, and get to a full vote. So fast forward, I think, 16 years to 2019 um, when we, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church and, and many other um, faith partners and advocacy organizations got together again and worked on a piece of legislation that dealt this time with religious freedom issues more comprehensively, but also balancing those with LGBTQ civil rights. And so that piece of legislation was the Fairness for All Act. Well. Again, um, being involved in the drafting process, thank you, Todd, for this, we just incorporated, or the, the coalition incorporated the language of the Workplace Religious Freedom Act and that accommodation standard, that reasonable accommodation standard, into fairness for all. So that legislation was introduced in 2019. And again, it was reintroduced in 2021. We anticipate it will be introduced uh, again this fall. Um, so a lot has changed in the political environment and even in, in society um, since the early 2000s as far as how religious freedom is viewed mm. um, and, um, and the willingness to accommodate it. And so um, unfortunately, the Fairness for All Act has only received, and, and I, I, th I would consider it a balanced piece of legislation as far as trying to accommodate um, both LGBTQ civil rights and religious freedom, um, but has only been able to attract uh, uh, Republican support. Mm -hmm. uh, now that support doubled from 2019 to 2021. Uh, so it got more attention, um, but then, but we, um, again, there is not, there has become an unwillingness or um, to, to view favorably, and I am um, Christian people who who take their their faith very seriously. I guess if that makes sense, or or value it very much, and certainly that's we see that challenge in so many different aspects of our lives, um, and so. That's where we are as far as the legislation. Um, I will say that in the conversations that I had surrounding Fairness for All, which is the um, legislative effort that, that I've been um, able to participate in, there has been not universal support in the various offices that I visited, but there has been bipartisan support for the religious workplace accommodation. Uh, portion of the legislation that hasn't been the sticking point that I've you know that I have seen um, there has been you know there was some pushback um, but it wasn't and so I find that encouraging um, and we will see uh, what is next I think unfortunately um, if you know the first four months of this year are any indication there's probably not going to be a lot that uh, happens legislatively um, for Fairness for All or for any other sort of uh, religious freedom legislation. But, you know, I have been surprised before and I would, I would love to be surprised again. So I'm curious, Melissa, like how do you decide what issues or matters to actually get involved in? Like how do you determine, determine that? Sure. So, you know, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has always prioritized the religious freedom interest, again, both of the organization and as the individual. And I think that, that we, we are not alone, but we're unique in prioritizing both of those. 
the religious freedom interests of the organizations. And some of our work that we uh, see, we see, you know, um, faith groups or, or advocacy organizations really focus on the, the churches or the organizations religious liberty interests, but they're not paying, you know, they're not spending as much time on the individual interests. As Jennifer mentioned, our religious freedom rights are tied to our individual conscience, right? And certainly as Christians, we believe that to be the case as well. And so, so the church has always advocated for that. We've also, if you look back historically, you know, we look at um, societal issues that where we're seeing injustice happen. Um, and, uh, you know, and then also public health interest. Um, there is also, and so, you know, we have conversations with our, well, right now, I would say uh, we've also been talking about um, really fascinating things like tax exempt status and, and that we advocate on um, and, and also um, dealing with the religious freedom um, rights of uh, individuals on public colleges and university campuses and the right for those organizations, for religious organizations to basically make decisions as far as their leadership and who um, and, and have standards for that leadership on public um, college and university campuses. Um, the, certainly the priority for the Adventist Church, I mean, Bill and I are, are really the ones that are sort of doing the, the work in DC and we, you know, we have other responsibilities besides that too. And so I think there's, you know, both as a church, you know, uh, determinedly wanting to, you know, needing to prioritize religious freedom as, as what we focus on in our advocacy work, but also just from a purely logistic skill as well, that, that has to be the priority. Thanks for that. Bill, can you add on a little bit? I mean, especially in your new role and what I've learned about your background and the, the PhD that you have, what is the history of the Adventist Church in terms of getting involved in like legal advocacy? And, and what are your thoughts on that? Almost from day one of the organization of Seventh-day Adventist Church, the church had to begin advocating for the religious freedoms of its members. The church is organized six weeks before the Battle of Gettysburg, right in the middle of the American Civil War. And its position on non-combatancy had to be advocated for with the Union government. And in fact, J.N. Andrews, a name well respected among Adventists, our first foreign missionary, a general conference president, is sent in 1864 to the provost general of the U.S. Army to advocate for non-combatancy rights for Seventh-day Adventists. Adventists avoided not just uh, uh, taking bearing arms, they avoided involvement with the military altogether at that era. Three areas of heading, if you will, that have really characterized Adventist engagement with religious liberties. The issues related to combatancy, have occupied the first 40 some years of the church through the First World War and dozens of Seventh-day Adventists were jailed for periods of time because they would not bear arms in basic training in World War I. Ultimately, those issues were adjudicated. So issues related to non-combatancy. The second area was areas of where Sunday work or Sunday labor was prohibited. And beginning in the 1870s, particularly in the American South, a large number of Seventh-day Adventists were arrested, fined, many of them jailed. In fact, there are some famous pictures of chain gangs in the South made up of Seventh-day Adventists who had violated local or state statutes by working on Sunday in places where Sunday labor was prohibited and the government had come down on the side of enforcing uh, a Sunday sacredness. A key defining moment came in 1888 when a bill introduced uh, by a U U.S. Senator and generated through the National Reform Association uh, tries to make Sunday a day of, of uh, rest, recreation, and no labor across the, ba across the basis of American society, ostensibly not on a religious basis. Uh, A.T. Jones recently arrived in Washington, D.C., heading up the church's religious liberty effort, uh, testifies very eloquently, and in fact, the, read the transcript of that testimony sometime. It's a fascinating story of a man who uses his formidable intellectual skills and his knowledge of the founding documents of America to argue for the fact that 
even if the day being protected was one for Seventh-day Adventists, he wouldn't want it. That in fact, no day ought to be protected by the federal government for any purposes that seem to accommodate a religious group. Uh, ultimately, he and uh, was successful, that never got out of committee, and, but the church began working on a series of issues related to day of worship and the inability declared by many governments for Seventh-day Adventists and others to labor on Sunday. Uh, the third area is the one that we're really gathered around today, which is workplace religious freedom. And that has really occupied the attention of the church for most of the last six decades. Uh, as you're hearing, up to a thousand cases a year, Seventh-day Adventists uh, involved in employment issues. Uh, due to some of the people on this platform, those cases have turned out favorably in a number of instances. Others have been headed off before litigation because of the active involvement of individuals here. That's the kind of proactive work the church attempts to do, not waiting to react necessarily to only those moments where an individual's in jeopardy legally or, or in their employment, but to work proactively and to influence legislation. As Melissa has suggested, learning where legislation is emerging from, interacting with those crafting the legislation, many of whom may have no malice toward our position, but may be simply unaware of it, may be unaware of the fact that their legislation is going to challenge basic constitutionally guaranteed liberties for American citizens. Um, these have the, been the three classic areas of Adventist engagement, religious liberty, workplace being the most frequent and the most recent. So from a membership standpoint, the individuals in our audience who are watching online, like is there any way in which they can get involved in terms of this legislation? I know people have thoughts around not being involved in politics in any way. Any thoughts you have on that? You know, there's a, a standard phrase that floats around Adventist membership that Seventh-day Adventists shouldn't be involved in politics. Now, we can think in this congregation of some notable exceptions to that. <laughs> but the phrase itself is a piece of mythology. It's traced back to a myth that Adventists shouldn't be involved in politics. What we mean to say is that Seventh-day Adventist Church as an organization and its regional units should not be involved in partisan politics. Politics is simply the business of the people. If you live, breathe, and work in this society, you are inevitably in a political environment. But partisan politics is the pursuit of objectives under the name of an organization whose future plans you cannot predict. You cannot, if, if any of you on this platform can predict where either of, of the two major political parties in this country will be in 20 years, please let me know because I'd like to place a wager. Uh, <laughs> it simply doesn't work that way. Political parties move to the issues of expedience, and which is why Seventh-day Adventists have wisely avoided engagement as administrative units with uh, political and partisan organizations. We do, however, work as A.T. Jones did on the principled issues of defending not only Seventh-day Adventist rights and liberties, but those of all persons of faith and no faith. Jones made the point quite eloquently and others continue to make that point. The freedom that we wish for ourselves must be available to those with whom we disagree, with those with whom we differ theologically and those who have no faith at all. We have to defend their freedoms just as aggressively as we would wish to defend ours. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I have a question for you, Jennifer. As we talk about this case um, and talking about religious freedoms in the workplace, there's a term called protected class. I wanted to talk about like what that means. But more so, if you can explain, like, is there a difference between what a person believes in terms of their religious beliefs versus what they actually practice? And how does that impact everything that we're talking about in terms of religious freedoms in the workplace? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, according to the text of Title VII, there is a difference because it protects um, uh, observance, practice, as well as belief. So, so they named three categories within the religion definition. Um, and so 
you know, we, we try not to add extra words into legislation, so those words have to have something unique that they're bringing to, to this. Um, and so, but the question is always on where, where is that line drawn? That there are some people who want to say everything I do is a religious practice because it is supported by one of my religious beliefs or it furthers one of my religious beliefs. Um, to me, that's a little too expansive of a definition of religious practice. Um, you know, sometimes I watch TV and it's a religious practice and sometimes I just watch TV. Like, you know, <laughs> context is important in what is happening here. Um, and, and oftentimes within our religious freedom community, the fights that we have within the community itself is not over should something be protected or, or not, it's where do we draw the line? Like w w what has to be protected, what has to be accommodated, and what, um, uh, what are the I I instances where an accommodation would, would cause too great of a harm to someone outside of that religious community? And so that's where most of our fights happen. It's not over should we protect something. Um, there is a really old case from the 1800s that, that says there is a difference between between belief and practice, and your belief is 100% protected, and your practice, you know, cannot be so. Um, but if you just read the, te the text of Title VII, at least that Congress thought that, that there could be some distinction, and so they wanted to protect all three. Thanks. Alan, Todd, anything you want to add to that? This concept of religious beliefs versus religious practice, and how that ties into everything that we're discussing. No, I think Jennifer, she, she got it right. I mean, it, it, it is, there are contexts in which those distinctions matter, but in Title VII, it's all part of the definition of religion. In fact, that was what they clarified in 1972, right? And before that, the argument was, well, no, it's just, you know, just your belief or your status. And then they, they changed that in 1972. So that is, that is, unfortunately, not a fight we've had to happen. And by the way, we can thank a Seventh-day Baptist for that. It was a senator at the time, and he's the one that shepherded that, um, that particular uh, part of the 72 amendments through. I would just add that, you know, for the most part, the issue of whether someone's belief is sincerely held is not a factor in most of these cases because by the time we get to court, they've lost their job rather than compromise their belief. Now, I did have, I think this will be of interest to this group. I had a couple of cases recently where we had summary judgment motions filed, one in Arizona and one in uh, Nevada. So in the Nevada case, we had a, a, a part-time housekeeper who, when she was only getting literally like maybe a shift every other week, she did accept one or two Saturday shifts because she was really, really needy. But then clearly she lost her, you know, she, she lost her job and was fired because she consistently turned down Saturday shifts. She would not work on Sabbath. And the court said that did not create an issue of fact as to the sincerity of her belief, even though she had worked once or twice on Sabbath. But then the next case, I had a, a truck driver who was fired who was adamant about not working on Sabbath, but he had, in fact, again, when he wasn't getting much work, I think 13 times over two and a half year period, he had accepted uh, Saturday shifts. And the court said, well, that is, uh, that does raise an issue of fact as to the sincerity of belief, even though he had lost his job rather than continue to compromise on Sabbath. Hmm. So that's kind of where the rubber meets the road. Thanks for sharing that, Alan. You know, there's, as I was researching this case and trying to understand some of the legal terms as well, there's a term I saw that was collective bargaining, a collective bargaining agreement. So I'll ask you, Todd and Alan, like what impact can that have on religious liberties in the workplace? But before you even answer that, mm -hmm. can you explain what is a collective bargaining agreement? Sure, it's collective bargaining agreement or CBA as we call it in the United States. It's just simply when you have a unionized environment, it's the written agreements, the contract. Mm -hmm. So we use that term CBA, and it's supposed to be collectively bargained, meaning the union represents the, the uh, employees and management has their representatives. So there is a question about whether or not there can be, if, 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 what's the employer's obligation to accommodate, especially in the face of, say, a collective bargaining agreement as far as how you schedule and how you uh, assign work? Because oftentimes that's one of the important things that employees will, will negotiate over, right? So, and that is what's, when Alan talked about that second question, the impact on co-employees, it's what we lawyers like to call question presented, right? That's how the Supreme Court puts it. So the second question presented. And the, 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 what 
Hardison said back in the 1970s, and this part is not being contested, is that if a person has a seniority right, then you can't violate that to accommodate someone's religious belief. And that's because Title VII has a very specific language in there about seniority rights and saying that those are going to be protected regardless of the requirements under Title VII. Now, that was put there actually for some pretty bad reasons. And those reasons were is when you passed the Civil Rights Act in 1964, you'd had decades and decades of racial discrimination. And so you had all these employees, you know, if you were a black employee, you were at a big disadvantage because you've been discriminated for 20, 30 years. And what Congress made and sort of the Civil Rights Act was made this sort of compromise, right? Uh, and said, well, we're not gonna disrupt seniority rights even if they would have been discriminatory historically. And, but there's other parts of a collective bargaining agreement than just seniority. And what their Allen and his team and they're arguing Groff is, listen, you've gotta leave the seniority rights alone but non-seniority rights, which is exactly what was in Groff's case, where it was just going through a list, right, just a list of names, uh, those have to give way to Title VII requirements. In fact, I have a case right now against an airline, and there, the way they would, uh, everyone would have the same seniority, and so they would just assign shifts based on the last four digits of your Social Security number. Well, that's not seniority. You don't have a seniority right in your Social Security number. And so that's kind of where we think the line should be, and hopefully the court will make a clarification there. If, if the unions get their way, you know, going back to my case against one of the big casinos, against Caesars, um, they had the part-time housekeepers basically on a list, on a rotation. And um, yeah, it was by order of seniority, but they'd just go down the list when they needed to fill in for a full-time housekeeper who was out sick or on uh, their day off or what have you. And how hard was it to simply skip over the Sabbath keeper and then put her back in the rotation after for a shift after Sabbath. And really, would that have a significant impact on anybody that it would cause a problem that they couldn't do that or that they shouldn't be made to do that? You know, it, it's just like, be real, folks, be reasonable. But, but you know, the union's going to say no, and the management's going to say no. We have this system, and you have to stick to it, and any variation violates the system, and we're not, you can't do that. And, and that can't be right. It just can't be right. Thanks for that. Anything you want to add, Melissa? Yeah, I was just going to say, I, you know, I think a real challenge, you all are speaking to the, you know, the legal technicalities of, of everything, but I think a, a real issue that we've seen raised here is just the public perception of religion these days, and I think specifically Christians, and I think Christians, unfortunately, have been some bad actors in the name of Christ. Unfortunately, we have, we can have, where, you know, own some of that. Uh, as, but, but a lot of it also, I think, so what we're seeing, the accommodation uh, request that Alan was just describing, and we talked about other areas where we see um, accommodations take place all the time, whether it's for disability or for pregnancy or for, you know, family issues. Well, of course you would make that change for, the, for any of those individuals, and it wouldn't be a question. So why is it a question for the, for the religious believer? And I think that's where we, as ambassadors for Christ, can do better in, in presenting ourselves in a way that individuals will want to accommodate us. You want to add anything, Bill? There's a group of individuals who are actually front line to this conversation, even more than some of us on this platform. And that is the pastors of those in Adventist and other congregations who actually have the first interface with those struggling on these issues. We've noted that in a couple of cases, individuals haven't always had consistent behaviors with regard to their keeping of the, the, their principles of Sabbath. That's because they're human beings and they're struggling to live and work and bring their faith forward. Pastors are often the frontline individuals to help coach that kind of consistency and often to relate them to people on this platform and elsewhere, be the vital connectors to make sure that if their religious liberties are being compromised, there are defenders for that among the persons on this platform and the organizations they represent. Thank you so much for sharing well, that, Well, and, and Bill, one of my frustrations is that the pastors too often are not the ones who are aware 
and directing members to where there are uh, services, you know, are collective services available. I think of uh, Teresa Brown's case. Teresa Brown's story was featured in the Liberty promotion this year. And as she tells it, uh, she contacted 15 or 20 attorneys, none of whom were interested in her case, but one finally said, well, I know somebody who can help you and was referred to our office. You know, but I mean, where was her pastor in all of that? There is a great deal of education to be done, and uh, but along the way, many of us learn about these cases because of that interface with a pastor. Whether it's always handled as well as we could wish, uh, your point's well taken, but it, it represents another level of care available mm -hmm. to the person of faith in whatever tradition that to interface with the those in the legal profession who can help defend their constitutional liberties. Before we go to Q and A from the audience, just a, some yeah, points to be Melissa. Yeah, I just wanted to affirm what Bill had said, and so, you know, and absolutely, that is a central role that of, of the of the pastor. And just to plug a resource that the NAD Public Affairs and Religious Liberty Department has recently put together, we put together a three part continuing education course for pastors, and one of the um, one of the modules deals with basically walking local pastors through, okay, so your church member has a Sabbath accommodation issue, what's the next step? What, what is their role? And again, spiritual shepherd and is, is the main part, but then that conduit or liaison with the, and so um, that's on the Adventist Learning uh, Community website, or it will be, we literally just finished the editing, it should be up within a month, but check that out, it'll be under the Religious Public Affairs and Religious Liberty Ministry. So I mean, just to make sure I'm hearing you clearly that our members and those who are watching are hearing clearly, if there is an issue that they're having, then they should really come to their pastor first, who's gonna help to filter this. And then as pastors, then we will be coming to you to get more guidance on like what that next step should be. Yeah, absolutely, that's, a, that's exactly right. And I think the very good news is that most of the time, Issues are are able to are are successfully resolved just by having the pastor engage with the local, you know, with the HR department and explain, you know, the new, so yes. All right. I'll, I'll stop now so that we can do questions. <laughs> All right. So I'm sure you have tons of questions. I have a lot more, but we want to give some time for you in the audience to ask your questions. You can raise your hand. You can come to the mic. Um, Nick Miller will be coming so, around too. Yeah, just uh, actually while, uh, just to alert everyone, you talked about the live stream. This is being live streamed over YouTube. We have an audience out there at least two or three times bigger than in here, actually. And it is also being recorded. So visit the YouTube page for the Spencerville Adventist Church, and you can either view this again or put it on your Facebook page or share it with others, right, and spread it around so that this information can be widely distributed. I wanted to start the questions from the floor, and um, I'm wondering, sometimes with cases, you have unintended consequences. And let's say there's a robust victory here, and we, we uh, take the level of religious protection in the workplace from fairly minor up to substantial. And um, that would be a good thing for Sabbath keepers and, uh, and those who need to wear headdresses or other religious um, uh, convictions in the workplace. But we're also living in a time where we have a very contested culture war. And religion is sometimes, religious protection has sometimes moved from being a shield against intrusions to being perhaps a sword for your own convictions. And maybe a, an example might be, and this is a bit controversial at times, but we just had the whole pandemic uh, situation with vaccines and masks. And so would a much higher religious freedom standard give a much greater ability for nurses and health persons to resist wearing masks or being vaccinated in the workplace? And is that something we would be happy with as uh, paro leaders in the church? Maybe I'll start by directing it to the lawyers in the group who, uh, who can talk about the legal standards. Uh, Todd, Jennifer. Uh... So, you know, I, I've done a four or five webinars on this topic. Uh, starting early on, I think, in the fall of 2020. And, you know, I'm very much aligned with the Adventist Church's 
uh, pro-vaccine position. And, uh, you know, and I'm not embarrassed to be fully vaxxed and boosted. Uh, our office has screened a lot of people who have uh, objected to the vaccines and many of whom clearly had non-religious reasons for doing so, but many of them had very religious reasons. Now, early on, I was very concerned that any of these objections in the healthcare context, courts would be very reluctant to touch them. Why? Because, you know, is a judge gonna sit in judgment on hospital administration um, being very cautious to protect the safety of their patients. You would think that the judge would want to defer to hospital administration. Well, lo and behold, you know, as time goes on, more and more hospital systems are actually accommodating people, at least some people, uh, in hands-on care, right? So one of the first people who comes into my office with this kind of claim is a phlebotomist. So what does a phlebotomist do? They draw blood. They're physically in contact with patients. And she tells me that uh, the other phlebotomist in her department was granted an accommodation, but she was not, right? So that immediately tells me that they don't really have an undue hardship argument, that, that they're willing to accommodate if they think somebody has a sincere belief. And then the question is, why did they not accommodate her, right? And does she, in fact, have a sincere belief? So, you know, for, my, for, for me, um, yeah, there, there certainly are people who have unfairly lost their jobs, many people who have been working remotely, who have been required to be vaccinated anyway, but who could have continued working remotely. So I, I think regardless of what the standard is, um, there were employers that, you know, we were in kind of a, a bit of a hysterical situation and, and there were overreactions. And, um, uh, you know, the, the pandemic certainly was a very, very, and continues to be a very serious problem. I, I, I'd be doubtful if anyone in this congregation um, knows nobody who died of the pandemic personally. I think, you know, all of us have been touched. I know, Bill, I'm told that at general conference worships, there were frequently lists of, of people who um, had passed because of, the, because of the pandemic. So, no, this has obviously been a very, very serious issue, but some employers really have gotten it wrong and, and have been able to, and willing, well, able to accommodate uh, in ways that did not impact public health. Okay, we have a question here. Give us your name and then Yes, I'm Dean Boland. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Very, very interesting. Um, the way it's been presented, it looks like it's a clear-cut win for the side, Alan, that you're uh, advocating in, in this, this from, panel. From your lips to uh, the court. But uh, <laughs> as with everything in our society now, it's, everything gets very politicized. What groups are lined up along with the uh, Solicitor General and are advocating against your position? So there were, I think, 40 some odd, uh, am so just to be clear here, there's this process in the Supreme Court called amicus briefs, right? Where parties can file a brief with the court, I'm sorry, non-parties can file a brief with the court saying, hey, this is what we think on the topic because what the court does uh, has a large impact. And so there was 40 some odd briefs, including two by the Adventist Church, one by the General Conference, another one with, uh, with our unions on the side of Mr. Groth. There were nine briefs on DeJoy's side um, they were, huh? No. That was oh, nine. 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 Nine briefs, 33, yeah. 33 yeah. in favor of Groff. Right. And so those fall into a couple categories, right? The unions uh, were against it because of the um, because of the seniority issues. In fact, I think just gratuitously anti-employee uh, in, in areas that didn't need to be. Um, and then there was a couple of other groups, uh, some business groups, and then a couple of other groups that were sort of on the LGBT side or Americans United filed briefs, just what I would just call anti-religious organizations um, that filed uh, raising sort of the third-party harm concerns. Uh, and then there was another group that filed uh, that was um, really just again, almost explicitly anti-religion, saying, well, any 
any protection for religion that's different than secular protections is unconstitutional. That's just clearly not the law in the United States. Um, so that was the primary groups that were lined up against. Not what I would call a robust opposition, um, even, from the, even from the business side. It's kind of hard for them to argue uh, that this is going to cause them a big problem given all the other forms of accommodation are out there. Remember, religion is the smallest group of all the different protected categories. Religion is the smallest by far. I would also point out that a lot of organizations when the when before the Supreme Court on Bostock, which is whether or not uh, sexual orientation and, and gender identity should be checked under current Title VII, they came down on the side of the employee. Basically saying, yes, Supreme Court, you should make the law so we get sued more. Uh, that was their literal position in the court. And so I think it would be very disingenuous of them to sort of take a different view here. Uh, but yeah, it was pretty overwhelmingly in favor of, of more religious protection. Well, but as far as those supporting Groff, the full spectrum of the faith community showed up pretty, mm -hmm. pretty uh, consistently. Mm -hmm. So we have a question from one of Andrews University's illustrious graduates, Jason Miller, <laughs> friend of mine when he was a student there and now he's in the DC area, Jason. Yes, thank you, Nick. So historically, religious freedom is a cause that has had champions across the ideological spectrum. Um, the dissenters in Hardison were the great liberal lions, Marshall and Brennan, yet today their ideological descendants might be the ones, and we don't know for sure, but it might be on Tuesday that those are the ones who might give Mr. Groff's side the most grief in oral arguments on Tuesday. So why do we have this ideological divide on religious freedom, particularly and more the, the free exercise side, and what can we do about it? Yes, we have the religious organizations lined up across the board, but there's still that ideological divide that we might see at the court on Tuesday. So what can we do about that, and what's going on here? Well, I think, I mean, the reason for that is, I think what, you know, what Melissa talked about, what Bill talked about, like there's just been this culture shift in 20, 30 years, right? And it, you know, I've only been working on this issue for about 17, but I've seen it, I would say 2006 when I came was sort of when it really started to, to, to swing the other way. Um, I'm not sure what the solution to that is. If I did, I, I, I you know, I believe me, I'd share it. Um, we'll see what happens. I have not given up hope that we couldn't have a 9-0 or an 8-1 decision, right? Um, especially, I think it's where the line sort of gets drawn. Um, but, you know, we'll see. I, I suspect Sotomayor is going to have some concerns about impact on third parties. Uh, and I think for, legitimately, right? Uh, I think probably the strongest argument we have against that is, and this was the brief that was filed, uh, we did it with Yale Law Clinic, looking at um, California, uh, New York's law and also Canada. You have states in the country that have had increased protections for decades, right? And what you haven't seen is this whole parade of horribles, right? This hasn't, you know, California has not turned into in the last decade some place where, you know, Christians are just beating up on gay people and using the law to protect them or New York. And so I, I think that, um, that is probably our best argument about why this is not going to turn into some weapon uh, in the workplace. Yet, you know, Linda Greenhouse, writing in the New York Times, uh, sees this as a Trojan horse for the religious right and for the Christian nationalist movement. Now, that's certainly not uh, what Seventh-day Adventists have been doing for decades in, in being leaders in advocating this issue. Um, but, you know, because everything gets cast in these political and culture war um, framework, yeah, we certainly run the risk of, of losing some votes uh, for those who are, you know, suspect about how the standard might be, you know, used or abused in the future. But, you know, I guess my premise is, there, you know, we can't eliminate conflicts. Like the, the, the main culture war conflict legally has to do with the clash between religious liberty and gay rights. And there are ways, like, Melissa was uh, touching on with Fairness for All, there are ways to minimize those conflicts and to, to figure out how we protect competing sets of rights. There are no ways really to, to define the field in a, that will eliminate the conflict in all cases. And that's why balancing tests are needed because nobody gets to win all the time. 
right? Uh, you know, it, cases are very fact specific, and you know, it's it's the balance is going to swing differently under different situations, and you have to have a test that's flexible enough for judges to be able to to do what we hope they'll do is is rough justice, you know. But obviously, they're human. And, uh, you know, Todd, they don't always see it the way I do. They don't. I don't know what's wrong with them. I, just you're not persuasive enough, Alan. They always agree with me. Um, the, uh, the uh, yeah. Uh, I think one of the things that's important here to talk about is, you know, one of the issues when we've been doing practice groups, which Alan was kind enough to invite me to do a couple of those, is the reality is over the last couple of decades, courts have been very uneven in how they apply this. There have been cases in which courts have allowed to go to the jury in fact, juries have won, that if you really, depending how strictly you want to deter minimal or more than de minimis right, you know, the courts could have ruled against. So what this means is, if a judge likes your case, he or she can find enough to let it go forward. If they don't, they, there's, they can just say, well, this would have caused an undue hardship and, you know, just some possibly could have had, had an undue hardship and therefore uh, dismissed the case. And that's really not the, law, the way the law is supposed to work. So by having this increased standards, I think it should force more of these cases to go to a jury trial. And, and there, you know, you get to have to convince, you know, 8, 12 people, depending on what it is. And, and that's going to just really put it back into, I think, where, where it should be and really encourage employers to avoid litigation and just do the right thing, accommodate. Where there's a will, there's a way. I think also it's important for employees to do the right thing as well. You know, we're certainly advocating on behalf of the employee, but I think, again, wanting to be the individual who is who is coming at this from a sincerely held belief, right? Asking for a reasonable accommodation. So I would hate to see the standard restored as we want and then it just abused, right? And then that's actually going to be, you know, I think more challenging for for individual believers with sincerely held beliefs than, than what we're experiencing now. So I, that I think is a legitimate concern, but I think it is one that the court and the legal system already has addressed, right? So the, there's the Supreme Court has taken, after Groff will be the fourth time the Supreme Court has heard a case about the accommodation requirement in Title VII. The second case they took in 1986 was a case called Ansonia. And what that case said was, you know, you can imagine there's a bunch of different ways to accommodate a person if they need Sabbath off. You can give them just a time off, right? Unpaid leave. You can say, fine, you get Saturday off, but you have to work every Sunday. Or, I mean, there's just a, a panoply of ways they can do it. What the Supreme Court has said is that the employer gets to choose the accommodation. So the employee can't hold out and can't abuse it for the most best and favorable accommodation. And so, um, in fact, they even said in Ansonia, that, the, that if the employer can choose a form of accommodation that pays less or costs the employee some money. So I think that there is already there a mechanism so that if a religious employee tries to abuse it, uh, that they will, um, uh, you know, the employer has some, some tools there to make sure that it's not being abused. I would say, going back to the sincerity issue, putting the vaccine issue aside, which I don't even want to talk about, um, the, uh, the, the reality is that um, this has not been abused, right? If you look at the cases and you look at what the kind of cases that have been brought, you really have a hard time uh, finding any type of abuse. The only kind that you see, and this isn't really Title VII is on sort of religion, is in the you know, institutional prison context, you know, that's a little different situation. And um, drug cases, uh, there's been some, some, some funny stuff there, uh, but really in the main uh, workplace, I, you'd be really hard pressed to find an abuse, I think, in, in, in our case law. We have a few more questions. I want to make sure that we're able to address those questions. Yeah. Jerry Chase, I just want to say thank you for today's uh, discussion and also for the work that um, different organizations, including the Adventist Religious Liberties Department, uh, does in this area. Um, Alan, you followed up on some comments um, that Melissa made earlier about the shift in culture regard to accommodating religion and that there's maybe an increasing hostility towards Christian religion. Um, I've also noticed that there seems to be a shift within Christians in upholding the concept of religious liberty for all. 
And um, it makes me nervous about our own denomination's stance and the ability of this department to continue operating. Any thoughts on that? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure why you're concerned about our department. Um, you know, within the, certainly within the Christian legal community, you have at least one prominent organization that primarily represents Christian interests. And you certainly have a, a number of others who, who are very focused on, on conservative Christian values and, and, and interests. But you also have some prominent organizations that will represent people of other faiths and that, that uh, understand and defend the principle more broadly. So it, it certainly is a mixed bag. Um, there, you know, with the, the conservative movement on the Supreme Court and within kind of the culture war climate, uh, there's been dramatic shifts in how the Constitution is interpreted. And, um, uh, you know, yes, there is certainly a, a vigorous debate within our own church about how we understand the Establishment Clause and our historic commitment to the separation of church and state. But we're certainly always going to be defending religious freedom. So I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm not sure if I really got to the heart of your question or not, but <clears throat> maybe I didn't understand it fully. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so part of the religious liberty uh, publications is supported through financial giving at the local church. And I found that people that I interact with that are my age or even younger um, have commented very negatively about the concept of religious liberty. And they work for the church. So it, it shocked me. And that, um, that, that there was a focus on religious liberty and that was, they saw that as encroaching on their Christian. So religious liberty is being abused, used as a sword rather than a sword. A sword is, as, yeah, I think so. Christian America, religious freedom for Christian use in America and, and defending a kind of Christian nationalism. But yeah, so when we talk about religious freedom for the Muslims, then, then that's a sword against Christians, I think would be one way of expressing. Does that help? So one thing that I, going back to what Bill was talking about in our church legacy, and I, and this is true for the Baptist uh, church as well, is that I would say that we are, we as a denomination have been consistent in our understanding of religious liberty. I think that's because we're spending times in, 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 our, in our Bible and, and spirit of prophecy and we're recognizing that value of the separation of church and state. And also because we have that minority faith mentality that Bill was talking about as far as, can you imagine you're a fledgling faith tradition and oh, by the way, there's this civil war and we don't wanna act like we're pro-slavery, but also because we're, we weren't, let's be clear there, but also we, we have issues with combatancy, participating in that. You know, we are used to that posture and I think that that's one of the reasons that we have been um, uh, pay, we've been, we recognize the right to, or the, the, the need to stand up for other diverse faith traditions um, in the way that, so, so I feel like you should be confident that the public affairs and religious liberty department will continue to stand. So we'll hear a yeah, comment I, from, from you, Jennifer, and then we have two questions from the audience and then we'll continue. I just want to add, as the Baptist in the panel, I've worked with Melissa for a long time, and she has always stood for religious freedom for all. And, I'm, and I've had conversations with Bill, and I fully intend that to continue to, to be the direction. Um, but we, like, outside of legislation and outside of court cases, like, we as Christians have a role to play in this. And so we have a, a duty to stand up when one of our religious neighbors is being discriminated against. If they're not being allowed to build their house of worship, we should be the first line at that town council meeting saying, I'm never going to worship there, but my neighbor deserves to have a house of worship that they can go to, and I, I am here to make sure that that happens. We should be the ones writing the letters to the editor. It shouldn't, the burden shouldn't always fall on the minority religious group who is trying to just live and operate in this world, and that is why Baptists and Seventh-day Adventists and others have, have traditionally had very long-standing relationships and, and, and worked together on these issues. Uh, my name is Anton Dormer. Uh, my question goes down to the new standard that the court or that 
you guys want to come out other than the de minimis going to something higher. Do you see that the same issue might occur where lower courts might have a difficulty applying a higher standard? And should we be asking for a more ad hoc test, something that allows the courts to apply, and what would that look like? So we are absolutely concerned about, assuming we get a win in Groff, right, what the lower courts do, what the Court of Appeals handle this. And that's why the church's religious liberty you know, department is not going away. In fact, with North American Division, we have been setting up for probably about 15 years now, the money that we had prevailed in, sort of be, we have a budget on putting that in a reserve fund, realizing there's likely to be an increased number of cases. And I think North American Division, is, uh, who sponsors the, the litigation here, is, is committed to, to doing that. So, yeah, there is going to be a fight in the Court of Appeals on this issue, and it is going to be important that we, that we keep up that and make sure that, they're, that they are applying that correctly. As for the standard that's being asked, it is... It is the same as the Americans with Disabilities Standard. It doesn't come from there, but we believe in Groff, and maybe Alan, you can talk about this a little bit more. And this was, in our case, by the way, this is what we were probably likely to have done in Patterson or Dalbristi, the two cases we had the court didn't take, was saying, listen, this phrase, undue hardship, has a particular meaning in American law, and the only thing that happened with the ADA was they just codified it because they knew of what the court had done in Hardison. So I think that's the standard we're going for. The, church, the Adventist Church actually, it's in its brief, argued for potentially even a higher standard because of some EOC regulations, but we'll see where the court comes down. I think we had a final question. Thank you. My name is Hannah Kaleova, uh, and I have a deep respect for, all, for the work of all of you. Thank you so much for fighting for our religious liberty. Uh, I also appreciate the comment how we should fight for the rights of people, you know, who have a different view than, than we do. Uh, and so I would like to come back to the vaccines. I know it's a controversial topic and I'm um, not necessarily, you know, fighting for one side or the other. But just, just from this standpoint, uh, you know, everyone has the right to receive the vaccine or decline it. So uh, isn't that something that the church should, you know, protect the rights of their members to decide, um, you know, what to do with, with their body? So um, I'll address this, I think, sort of as probably one who's worked on this for the longest. So just to be clear, the church has its stance, which includes a section that says church members have the right uh, to, to seek beliefs even though it doesn't line up with the churches, right? So that statement, which has been misconstrued uh, by some, especially even some Adventist pastors and people who've been given the pulpit, I think they've been dishonest in how they've construed that statement. Also, that state, the law, the reality is it's individual belief, not corporate belief. So the idea that that statement was harming church members or whatever, I just don't think lines up with what the law is. Uh, and a lot of, there was a lot of organizations out there representing them and some that were extremely successful. Matt Staver's group got a settlement for, I think, millions of dollars from the hospital system. So there were people... Ten million. Yeah. To, ten and a half million. Ten and a half million. Nice. So there were plenty of this. I think the question then was whether the Adventist Church was going to take those cases. The Adventist Church had, had decided not to. Um, and that was for a couple of reasons, including sort of just the confusion that could happen. Like, well, the Adventist Church doesn't believe this, but this church member has an individual belief, but yes, we're representing them. Also, it's a matter of resources, right? We don't have unlimited budgets, and we just felt is representing individuals in a, you know, in, at a trial level, is that the best use of our resources? And I think those factors putting together, I, I will also say uh, this was not unique to the COVID vaccine. We had made a determination on the litigation committee, which I'm secretary of, that we weren't going to take flu shot cases. And this was well before the COVID vaccine. And it was for the reasons that I had mentioned was it's just too confusing and it, it also just is not where we want to put our resources. And I would also say there was huge concerns, in my, and I think in mind, about whether all of these people were sincere. I mean, I mean, talking to one particular employer, they had a group of mechanics who all of a sudden found religion. And I know talking to the general counsel, the organization is like, these are the least religious people you can possibly imagine. And then, you know, as a group, they all just found religion on vaccines. So I think those factors all kind of combined together uh, for why the church, again, I want to be very clear, 
just simply we don't take every case and we chose just not to take these cases. Yes, Melissa. Yeah, I was just going to add maybe a little gentler touch to that response and say that one thing that we did do and the church is an organization, you know, Todd, absolutely, and that's, and that's who he represents. But I can speak for, you know, Alan's level as far as the union, public affairs and religious liberty office. Those are the offices, again, when we talked about what do you do if you have a Sabbath accommodation issue? Well, what do you do if you want to be, if you want um, a request for a vaccine uh, for a, ex a vaccine exemption because of religious you do you go to your union public affairs and religious liberty office or if you don't know that ask your pastor and he will or she will direct you so all of that to say um, because of all of the reasons that Todd mentioned it did not make sense to the church to write on church letterhead this is the position of you know because that first of all that would be disingenuous besides the fact that it would be confusing but I can tell you, as an individual that interacted with all of those office, their full-time job for many months was helping individuals craft their own letters of, of requesting that accommodation. As we said many times before, it is your individual conscience right. And so it, that doesn't diminish the effectiveness of letter, but they help them with the legal language, they help them with every, all of that. And so while it wasn't appropriate for the church to, you know, uh, say this is, we are, we are representing this individual on this behalf, they helped them with their own conscience so choice. we did, I was involved in this, I was the parole director for the Lake Union, and I drafted a form letter that was used by my union and other unions <laughs> not for the church letterhead, but to give to our members. So we didn't share their convictions, but we supported them in their convictions and gave them the tools to pursue their consciences uh, as, as, as they felt convicted to do so. So we didn't abandon them. There's been these claims of, well, the church just disregarded. No, it's not true. We listened to them, we cared for them, we helped them put letters together, and uh, that was the support we could provide, and we did. So I know there's so many other questions that we probably have, but we have limited time. So as we wrap up this panel discussion, I'll start with you, Bill, and each of you can share your thoughts on this. What do you see as the greatest upcoming challenge within religious liberty? I would say in many cases, the unintentional aggression of a, a legislative system and even a judicial system to infringe on, on, on rights of individuals in these areas. I say unintentional because it's rarely deliberate. It's often discovered in accident. However, Seventh-day Adventists have had since the beginning a fierce loyalty to the founding documents of the American Republic and a deep suspicion that the government might be involved in taking away those freedoms. Those two things have belonged together throughout our history. And I think watching those two move forward, uh, uh, fiercely defending the rights given by God and recognized in our founding documents, and also wary that the processes of human governance invariably move toward majoritarianism and overrunning the rights of individuals. Thanks. Jennifer? Um, well, first, I just want to say thank you as the Baptist on the panel for letting me come. I've always had warm <laughs> welcome from my Seventh-day Adventist friends, and so I appreciate that it continued again tonight. Um, at Baptist Joint Committee, we, we have identified what we think is the greatest threat to religious freedom, and it is Christian nationalism, which has come up in some questions and some talks. Um, so I'm happy to come back and talk about that at some point in the future. That's a whole other, other subject. Um, but the quick resource I can point you to is we have a campaign called Christians Against Christian Nationalism, and the website is Christians Against Christian Nationalism nationalism.com um, or .org. I apologize on that one. Um, but check it out. We've got resources. We have a statement. We would love for you to sign it. And it, it's, you know, why we as Christians um, are, are opposing this dangerous ideology. All right. Alan? So let me start by saying what he said and what she said. <laughs> and we've already, we've published our own uh, pamphlet about Christian nationalism. We're going to have to send you a copy. But... Um, <clears throat> I'm going to um, add something specific to the situation with, with religious accommodation and the Groff case. You know, we can change the law and we can create a better legal balance between the rights of the employee and the obligations of, of the company. What we cannot do is change the power imbalance, right? Because the employer has so much more power that they can thumb their nose at the law. And, you know, one of my observations has been that 
the entire budget of, of a large company to, to settle their, all of their employment disputes in a given year isn't even going to make a footnote in their annual corporate report. You know, getting companies to care enough to actually come to the table and deal responsibly with these issues, that's an enormous challenge. Now, one of the upshots of a Supreme Court case is that <clears throat> in the coming months afterwards, you have a whole industry of, of uh, law firms that represent companies and HR professionals and training and seminars and webinars and all of that where you know, hopefully this will, there'll be a, a spotlight shined on this issue and maybe, just maybe, some will get the message, oh, you mean we really do have to accommodate? And, and maybe we will make a dent in that culture that says, oh no, we just treat everybody the same. We don't have to do anything special for you. So that's, that's my hope, but that's the challenge. Todd. I think for me, as far as religious liberty, uh, generally, my, my biggest fear is, as far as what other people said, is sort of the politicization of it, right? Religious liberty used to be an issue that we could agree on. It was one that Democrats were as supportive as Republicans, and that is just, that is no longer the case. And somehow we've got to get back to this idea that religious liberty is for all and that it's not just one particular party or another. I'm not sure how that happens, but that is my biggest fear because political, uh, you know, pendulum swing. And it shouldn't be dependent on an election or who's able to get, you know, judges in, uh, you know, appointed and confirmed in the Senate. Melissa. Yes, 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 and yes. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to point out, this is fortuitous. I mean, on a, well... I want to talk about another resource and another event opportunity, and that it's a religious liberty conference that we are hosting down at Southern Adventist University, October 20 and 21. The title or the subject that we will be looking at through panels, through um, you know, uh, speakers, is reconstructing religious liberty in a time of secular and religious extremes. And I think that's what we've been describing. That's what we are experiencing currently. You know, Alan mentioned something about we can't all we I, we can't win every time. That's the mindset, whether you're talking about the left or the right or whatever, is that, no, I need to win every time. And there's no desire for caring about the rights of your community. So if you were interested in that particular event, uh, it's in-person only event, please visit our website, www.religiousliberty.info slash events. Thank you. Well, just want to give a round of applause to all of our panel members. So we thank you for all the information that you've shared, your expertise on the topic. And I pray that for everyone who's here in the congregation, those who are watching online, that you recognize the importance of religious liberties. It's beyond just this panel discussion, but something that we all should take very, very seriously. Um, for those of you who are pastors that are watching and members who were here, remember what was shared earlier, the importance of coming to your pastor to talk about issues that you have so that we can help to facilitate that for you and have the conversations with the appropriate individuals. So we thank you again for joining the panel. Thank Last you. comment. Pastor Crystal, just to let people know, there'll be one other chance to hear about this topic after the oral arguments on Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock. You can listen to the oral arguments online if you're stuck at work and can't come down to the Supreme Court. But then that evening, Alan Reinick, who handled the case below, combined with one of the first liberty attorneys who's involved in the oral arguments in the Supreme Court is going to be at Washington Adventist University at the Honors College, 7 o'clock that evening. Bettina Krauss, editor of Liberty Magazine, and myself will be interviewing them about the oral arguments after they've happened, and so you can get their best guesses as to what the justices are thinking. It's in person. There'll also be a, a feed on the Liberty Magazine website, so look for that. Amen. Thank you for that, Nick. And now we'll have our final closing prayer by Bill. Pray with me, please. Father, we believe that you are the author of freedom, that you have given choice to human beings, and that you have given rights to each individual to choose, to follow you, to go their own way, but nonetheless to live out their decision with the freedom you intended. We ask that as we 
support each other and support the rights of those who may be struggling to experience that freedom. You will give us compassion and wisdom and a commitment to your justice. For we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.